The work of God has always relied on the generosity of believers. Today we call it stewardship. The Hebrews had their temple tax. As the early church in Jerusalem faced hardship and persecution, it counted on donations from churches throughout the Middle East. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 5, and chapter 9, verses 6 to 12, the Apostle Paul uses the generosity of the church in Macedonia to encourage the believers in Corinth to honor that promise of a gift to the Jerusalem church. We want you to know, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been granted to the churches of Macedonia. For during severe ordeal and affliction, their abundant joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For as I can testify, they voluntarily gave according to their means, and even beyond their means, begging us earnestly for the privilege of sharing in this ministry to the saints. And this, not merely as we expected. They gave themselves first to the Lord, and by the will of God, to us. I thought it, I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go ahead on ahead of you and arrange in advance for this bountiful gift that you have promised, so that it may be ready as a voluntary gift and not as an extortion. The point is this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. The one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you've made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves the cheerful giver. The God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply you and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your generosity which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgivings to God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to, to God. God. That one little verse, God loves a cheerful giver, tends to come up every year when churches have a stewardship Sunday. Well, first of all, yes, God loves a cheerful giver. But the trick is remembering that it's not just giving what we have. We use that word stewardship for a reason, even though that's probably not a word that you've used or heard of a lot. But a steward is somebody who takes care of things that belong to somebody else. It's like a manager in a business. The manager doesn't usually own the business, but they're responsible for making sure it runs right. Well, the idea of stewardship is that we don't really own all the things that we have. Even, even the clothes that you wear and the masks that you have on, is something you have because of all the things that God has given, all the things that have been possible in your family's life that have allowed you to have those things. And so when you get older and you have a job and you have income, that's opportunities that you've got because God has opened those doors for you. And it's your responsibility to decide what you're going to do with it. And some of that has to do with deciding whether you're going to, I don't know if you've ever heard about the people who spend millions of dollars to buy a diamond collar for their dog. I mean, really? 
Do you think that's a good stewardship? I don't think so either. But it's not just a matter of money either. When we talk about generosity, when we think of generosity, often that's what we think of, is how much money do you put in the offering plate? But there's also something that, that's described sometimes as a generous heart. Is that about money? What kind of things that are in a go would reflect a generous heart? Can you think of any? If I were to, well, there's a there's a funny kind of generosity that's part of our life right now. There's a we we might think of generosity as loving and giving a hug and showing how much you care in those kinds of ways. But these days, it can be more generous to not give a hug, to care about somebody enough this Thanksgiving, to care about your family enough that you're not going to go visit them. That's giving up something that is important to you because of your love for them. Generosity is about your whole life and how you live it and how much of what you have you keep for yourself and how much you share of your love, of your money, of the things that you learn. All sorts of things are part of what you can be generous with because they're all things that God has given you. Let's pray. Dear God, Thank you for all your gifts to me. Help me to have a generous heart and share what I've been given with all the people who need a piece of what I have. Amen. That was a long sentence at the end, I'm sorry. <laughs> and please pray with me for a moment. As we gather here this morning, Lord, as we think of all that you've given us, let us be generous to you and share with you our love, our devotion, our hearts. Let us think of how you've been generous to us and imagine how we could be generous to you. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts can be a gift to you this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, what is generosity? Does it depend on our bottom line? Or should it be sacrificial? Something beyond normal levels of sharing and combining the resources that we have? There aren't very many direct references to generosity in the Bible. You heard all of them this morning. <laughs> That's all there are. We learn more about the biblical meaning of generosity from contexts and the choice of particular Greek words. In Galatians, the word used for that fruit of the Spirit assumes good relationships with willingness to give or share a spirit of generosity. The word used in Romans is more often translated differently to match other meanings that include simplicity, integrity, sincerity, pure motives, wholeheartedness. It's as much about the act of giving as it is about the generosity behind it. The sense of giving 
communicated by the Greek, can be from one who is in a superior position to someone in a lower one. What is given may be an assignment and authority to carry it out. One in a lower position can also give. They give service or a gift of surrender to a higher up. Paul is speaking of gifts of grace from our greatly superior God who entrusts us with gifts, authorizes their use, and gives us responsibility of using them in our responsible ways, using them well in those assignments. We, in our lower position, respond by giving our service. A generous human giver would be one who shares, gives, or transfers to someone else almost anything. Food, support, knowledge, anything. We can hope that the Holy Spirit will transfer to us some of God's own generosity of spirit. In Galatians, Paul refers to the fruit of generosity without saying much about the nature of it. We learn more about that in 2 Corinthians, where the context is an offering being collected for the saints in Jerusalem. And the contrast between the tepid response in Corinth and the generosity shown in Macedonia. When describing the Macedonians, Paul uses superlatives. They have great affliction, yet their joy and delight is so abundant. The supply is superfluous as abundant as their wealth of generosity, despite their extreme poverty. In English, we say they gave according to and even beyond their means. But that's an understatement. The Greek words aren't about an ability to give, but about the power to give. Uh, as in a supernatural, wondrous, miraculous manifestation of power that has a tremendous effect. That was their gift. The Macedonians are begging for the privilege of giving with the passion and persistence of a child begging for candy. Except they don't want to get. They want to give. They're like, can I give? Can I, can I, can I, please, please? And they give with wholehearted sincerity, simplicity, openness, integrity, even determination. They know they've been given grace by God. The infinitely superior to the inferior. And they respond by humbly giving themselves in return to their Lord and God, which leads to their powerful, deeply life-changing financial gift to Jerusalem. Was their giving sacrificial for their context, their extreme poverty? Um, undoubtedly. Did they have the attitude of one making a sacrifice? Absolutely not. Paul is afraid the Corinthians view this offering as extortion or as giving, or they're giving grudgingly. That's a strong word Paul uses. Jesus used it when talking about greed, covetousness, avarice, wanting to have more than one share, and other rotten attitudes and bad behaviors that are the complete opposite 
of generosity. Grudging actions and behaviors occur when one person or group wants to make sure they have enough or really more than enough before we give away too much to others. As if the giving forced them to make a choice between us and them. Paul wants the Corinthians to understand there needs to be a commitment. And it's got to be from the heart, not treated as a pain-inducing necessity. He uses more superlatives. God being able to provide refers again to a mighty power, this time God's power. The blessings are abundant to the point of excessive, way more than necessary. There's always enough of everything, more than enough for the Corinthians to share abundance to the same excessive, way more than necessary degree to which they receive their blessings from God. That's the abundance with which God supplies and multiplies seed, just as God is causing the harvest of righteousness to grow and increase. That single-minded, pure, wholehearted simplicity of generosity will enrich the Corinthians make them wealthy in every way and result in overwhelmingly abundant thanksgivings. There's no us versus them. We're all us. We're in this life together. The Macedonians understood that and knew that Blessings sown bountifully are reaped bountifully. Back to the question, what is generosity? To get the big picture, look at God's generosity that goes way beyond money, then make human parallels. God is giving. We are to be giving. God gives cheerfully to the poor. We are to give cheerfully wherever there is need. The abundance of God's giving isn't limited to money. Ours shouldn't be either. Remember that God teaches us, shows us what generosity is expects us to carry out the task of showing it. That's our assignment. And maybe even transfers to us some of that divine generosity. Don't forget all the biblical teachings and examples of generosity there are, even if the word is never used. Keep in mind the power generosity can have, the, the mighty, almost supernatural impact that generosity can have. Recall all the moral qualities associated with the Greek word, sincerity, openness, integrity, simplicity of heart, single-minded determination. Our generosity should have all those qualities. Whether we're speaking of what we offer in our relationships or of what we give of our time, talents, and treasures, our energy, or our dollars. And... Generosity can be so 
even so so eager in its giving that the the bottom line financial costs is so irrelevant that it begs to give can i give can i please please what generosity means in practice will be different for each person but for everyone generosity as a fruit of the spirit will always be grounded in our relationships with God and with others and characterized by unexpected power a, a well-focused simplicity of heart an awareness of extravagant abundance and an overwhelming desire to be a blessing that's the real bottom line of generosity amen <laughs>